Well, the U.S. has reached a daily average of 100,000 COVID-19 hospitalizations. That is despite vaccines being free and available to the public. That's a number that we haven't seen since last winter, before most Americans were eligible to be inoculated. Dr. Anthony Fauci says the surge in cases is, quote, ex entirely predictable, but entirely preventable. However, around 40 percent of Americans have yet to receive at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. Meantime, with hospitals in Louisiana already overextended with COVID-19 patients, they're also having to deal with devastation and destruction from Ida. Dr. Mark Klein joins us now. He is a physician in chief and chief academic officer at the Children's Hospital in New Orleans. Thanks for taking some time out for us because we know you are probably extremely busy right now. Dr. Klein, um, Ida left more than one million people without power after it made landfall. Just give us a sense of how the aftermath has directly impacted your hospital patients and the number of staff you have available. Because, you know, of course, when we talk about these frontline workers, they also live in the area. They're also worried about their homes and their loved ones and also dealing with life without electricity as well. Right. Well, it's impacted us very heavily. Um, we have a, a staff here in the hospital, of course, that's been on lockdown since uh, early Sunday morning. We came in at about 6 a.m. And, and we've been here for the duration and will be here for the duration of the uh, event. The weather outside, of course, is cleared, but we're still dealing with the aftermath. And as you said, many of our other staff members have either evacuated the region entirely or are at home without power or running water or sewage. It's a it's a pretty miserable situation. Mm. Here at the hospital, we lost main power uh, about two days ago now, and uh, but we're running on auxiliary power. Uh, we have six uh, auxiliary generators, and uh, so all of the patient care areas are lit and the equipment is running normally. It's just the non-essential areas of the hospital that are that are dark and unair conditioned. So, Doctor, prior to Ida, a federal surge team of emergency responders was sent to help hospitals in New Orleans amid the surge in COVID-19 cases. Uh, are these responders still present, and are they available to respond to COVID patients? Glad they've uh, they've left at this point. They were redeployed, uh, so we're on our own. Fortunately, uh, we were able to discharge a sizable number of patients just before the hurricane hit. And uh, so the hospital census is not, not that high. Of course, we had no activity over the course of the 24 hours or so that the hurricane was passing through. And uh, even now the census figures are relatively low. So we have adequate staff to take care of all of the children that we have in house. Of course, we can't discuss anything happening in this country without sort of acknowledging the backdrop of COVID-19. You heard us lead, lead into you talking about the spike in cases and hospitalizations. We had been reporting prior to this that specifically children are being sort of more impacted. It makes sense if children under 12 are, are not eligible for the vaccine. And even over 12 had a, a much lower rate of vaccination um, than, than adults. Um, are you concerned that the impact of this storm because it's going to take a while to get things back online, is going to have a detrimental impact on um, New Orleans' fight against the COVID pandemic, particularly when it comes to kids. Yeah, I'm very concerned, Anne-Marie. I, I think that, um, you know, we had begun to make some progress, I think, with the governor's mask mandate and with uh, the, our mayor's mask mandate and vaccination mandate for restaurants and bars and, and sporting events. We had begun to turn a corner, I think. Uh, our test positivity rate for children had dropped from between 20 and 25% down to about 13% in the past week. Um, hospitals across New Orleans and Louisiana had seen a small downturn in the number of inpatients. That was the first time in several weeks that that had happened. So we really felt like we had turned a corner, but now we have thousands of people sheltered together, congregated, uh, some with masks, some not. And, um, you know, with all of the chaos that's been going on, probably masking is is not top of mind for everyone. And so I, I do worry a lot that we're going to see a, a resurgence. Um, children have been hit by this latest surge with the Delta variant uh, at a much higher rate than ever before. Uh, you showed the figure for the United States, 22.4% 
of all new COVID diagnoses in children. Here in Louisiana, it's about 28%. And um, we've just got to do a better job of, of masking up consistently, everyone in indoor spaces and even outdoors when, when we're with crowds. And it's so important to get vaccination, more important than ever before. Every responsible adult and adolescent over 12 years of age needs to get the vaccine. The American Academy of Pediatrics has reported more than 203,000 new pediatric COVID cases last week, doctor. That's the second highest week on record. Uh, these numbers coincide with the reopening of schools. Now, most schools require students to wear masks, but should more measures be taken to minimize cases in children or what measures can be taken to minimize cases in children? Yeah, I would say first and foremost is masks. Masks actually work quite well. There are good data now out of North Carolina and several other states showing that if masks are, are worn consistently by everyone in a school setting, that is by the students, by teachers, by staff, uh, it really can have a pronounced effect in reducing transmission to the extent that the authors of the study from North Carolina said, you know, maybe distancing isn't even required. And when a child is exposed to someone who has COVID, maybe quarantine isn't even required. That's how effective they found masks to be. But of course, we're not discouraging physical distancing. We also think that schools need to attend to things like their ventilation systems and uh, and keep not only keeping kids physically spaced in the classroom, but in buses uh, going to and from school. And so uh, those things are all important. But again, just coming back to you know sort of the obvious, we have very safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines. And, you know, even here in Louisiana, only 41% of adults have chosen to, to be fully vaccinated. And we've got to do so much better. That number needs to be 80% or 85%. And for each one of those individuals who is not vaccinated, not only are they putting themselves at risk, but they're putting at risk the most vulnerable members of our society, particularly children under age 12 who have not had an opportunity to be vaccinated. So. We've got to insulate and protect children from COVID-19. And the only way to do that is by having adults step up, take responsibility, get vaccinated, and then insist on consistent mask wearing. Right, if 80% of all adults that a child comes in contact with, sorry, Vlad, yeah, are vaccinated, that's exactly right. then you, you know, you're creating a vaccination bubble around them. So mm -hmm. even if you're uncomfortable with a child being vaccinated, the vac it, you know, the vaccines aren't available yet, but there's a possibility they could be available by December for those under 12. But even if you're uncomfortable with that, which I suspect we're going to hear a lot about that when I see, you know, some of the parents yelling and screaming about masks at some of these school board mm -hmm. meetings. So they really don't want to inoculate their child. If the child is surrounded by adults who are, who are inoculated, who are protected, then you kind of de facto protect the children as well. Mm -hmm. Like it should exactly. be such a no brainer, doctor. And I just I can't believe that that people are still sort of all wound up about this. Um, so uh, let me ask you about the prospects of kids having access to the vaccine, whether pe whether they get vaccinated or or not, but there is a possibility, uh, according to at least uh, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, member of Pfizer's board of directors, that that uh, vaccine could be available to children by December, children under the age of 12. Um, you know, your take on that timeline, do you think it's a realistic timeline? Does it seem from where your vantage point way far off in the future, considering, you know, you're dealing with children who are, who are coming to the hospital who have been infected? But, you know, what's your take on that? Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm impatient to see it to get at least emergency mm. use approval so that it's an option for parents who want to have their, let's say, five to 11 year olds vaccinated. Um, and so I, I'd like to see it done as soon as possible, but, but I don't want to cut any corners on safety. I don't think there's any question at all that the vaccine will be effective for young children and even down into infancy, probably. Uh, so that's not, not that's not an issue. It's really the safety angle. We want to make sure that the vaccines are as safe for young children as they have been for older children and adults. I'm being told that Pfizer could apply for emergency use approval as early as October, and that could mean that we would see shots in arms 
before the end of the calendar year. And I, I think that's a great goal to have. If they could speed it up a little bit and make it November, that would be even better. We, you know, we've got a lot of kids falling ill every day. Uh, most of them recover uneventfully, but some end up in the intensive care unit and unfortunately some die. And so we've got to do this as quickly as possible, cutting through the bureaucracy, but not cutting corners that could lead to safety concerns. All right, really important information as always, Dr. Mark Klein, we appreciate it, thank you very much. Thanks for having me again.